representatives. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a quick question, Doctor, and I'm glad to have a doctor here to guess this. Um, one of the problems, particularly we've been doing this for a long time, is, is, is always the research and where you get, you know, who, who do you believe, you know, which scientists is saying what. Um, and I'm looking through my pile of information here. Do you have, and you don't have to give it to me now, but do you have um, sites and, and so forth, you personally, since you are in the emergency room, where the information comes from as far as the, um, the, the information, which scientists are saying what, where, who do they work for, where do they come from? That is a great question. <laughs> uh, I, you know, you always have to be look where the information is coming from and, and whether it's a preponderance of evidence or whether it's a well-researched study. And, and a lot of the studies are not, that I'd like to see there, are not there. I'll, I'll, I will say that. There is a lot of information and I would certainly offer my expertise and assistance with, to this committee in um, uh, putting that information together, uh, uh, helping you interpret it, um, looking for those, uh, those underlying sources of funding or um, prejudice that may interfere in some of these studies. Um, so, uh, but yes, do I have to make my, you know, my back and call here? No. Um, in terms of the toxicology, though, I think there's a much better database. So virtually all states these days have what we call our poison lines. And they're uh, well-funded uh, toxicology centers. Um, and they put together large databases. And so when somebody comes into the emergency department, for instance, and, um, you know, we found these, these pills, okay? I don't know what they are. You know, my, my, my four-year-old took 12 of them. What should I do? And so we begin a process that first tries to identify them, and then once identifies them, um, looks to the drug databases that we have to see what their toxicity might be. And those databases are pretty good about the non-toxic effects of marijuana. I mean, there is no LD50. Um, we can look at the dosage ranges that are very specific and say uh, what are what are you know likely to cause serious medical harm and what aren't. Um, and so those are pretty reliable databases. They've been researched. Um, the research has been gathered. The experts have commented. They've been put together in a you know a cohesive format that's easily understood. And so those are I think reliable databases in terms of toxicology and side effects and those sort of things. In terms of the kind of studies we were just talking about with head-to-head -head comparisons between narcotics and marijuana, those are going to be much harder to come by. Um, but there certainly are sites that have been compiling that sort of information. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Gabriel's work? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, guess I just want to throw that in to um, uh, put on the record because, and again, I freely admit I've been, I've been in drug prevention for a long time, back to 1979. And uh, Dr. Nahas and uh, others, and he was an anesthesiologist at Columbia University. He did a lot of this, and, and he doesn't necessarily agree with your point of view, and that was scientific research. So, yeah, and that's what I kind of came up with. So I'm always interested in um, what research you're referring to, who's doing it, and so forth and so on. Um, I, and I would appreciate you know, seeing you know, um, where you're coming from on sure. all of that. Um, I, and I would like to just respond one second um, to um, the, the gateway question and to, I believe your remarks, um, ma'am, were um, you, you're not interested and maybe you are, you're not, I mean, I'm not going to get into that as far as um, uh, having people use marijuana, you know, that you don't want to do medical marijuana because is a foothold or a foot in the door for um, legalization of marijuana. Where a lot of that feeling comes from, for many of us that have done this, is from normal itself. A long time ago, so maybe they changed their position. But we have videotapes at normal conferences where they say the foot in the door is medical marijuana. This is my problem because I'm old enough, I sat in some of those normal conferences under an assumed name. I have to admit that. But many years ago, I did go and I did listen to the directors, uh, Richard Cowan is one of them, where he clearly says the answer to legalization of all drugs is um, um, the medical issue. So that reflects on some of the work that I've done and the kids and so forth. So anything that you have to offer, uh, contrary to that, um, and, and websites or links, I would appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to uh, give my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As has been mentioned, there's uh, 
multitude of conflicting information on this topic. So I thank the chairman for scheduling this hearing and I certainly want to thank the testifiers for trying to provide the committee with uh, your insights on this important issue uh, as we attempt to identify the, the best way to proceed legislatively. Um, earlier, there was a question about psychiatric patients or people suffering from a psychiatric condition. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, the doctor here if during the course of uh, a typical exam or the establishment of that patient-physician relationship, uh, would, would it be able to be ascertained whether that patient was suffering from a, a psychiatric condition that may contraindicate medical well, marijuana? Well, I would say, first of all, that um, a, uh, a legitimate relationship between a physician and a patient um, and a, a, a bona fide med a medical physical exam would include at least some evaluation of that. Let me start with that. The second question is a little more difficult. When you talk now, if you're talking about a bona fide psychiatric diagnosis, um, what we call major diagnoses, um, things like schizophrenia, bipolar disease, um, these are major diagnoses. And those are often um, uh, more discernible, if you will, um, than somebody comes in and is depressed. Uh, somebody who's depressed and comes into, comes into my office may be able to easily cover that um, and because they just don't want to talk about it. Um, but for the most part, we do make an attempt to, uh, to uncover those things. And I think one of the reasons that this bill is, is as important as, as it is is because it means that um, a physician does get a chance to make that recommendation and discuss the risks and benefits and, um, and does so after examining the patient um, in a medical setting, as opposed to um, what currently happens, which is if there's any discussion at all, it's kind of off the books. A physician, a patient may say, you know, I smoked some pot, you know, kind of thing, but you really don't want to put that in the record, and you really don't want to have a formal discussion about it. And, um, and then all of the information that he gets, and the amount that he uses, and the weight that he uses it, and the drugs that he mixes it with, um, are guided by his friends. And uh, that's just not a good thing. I think that we need to be um, especially uh, proponents of keeping medicine within physicians' offices between physicians and patients. And this bill will go on to do that. 